Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank the organizing committee and specifically Dr. Samah for inviting me. It's my first time in Kuwait and hopefully this would be a uh, first visit uh, for many more to come in the future. So I was asked to talk about rhythm versus uh, rate control in atrial fibrillation. And hopefully by the end of the talk, I'll convince you that there is a huge paradigm shift from rate control being the default uh, strategy in AFib uh, management to rhythm control. So bismillah. So this is the outline of my talk. <coughs> So I will just go very quickly on a neology. This was uh, touched upon by Dr. Samah and others. So there is basically an epidemic of uh, AFib um, uh, all across uh, the world. And our region is no exclusion. One of three individuals above the age of 55 is prone to have AFib. Um, and uh, the prevalence and incidence increases with increasing risk factors. So if you have diabetes, hypertension, sleep apnea, you basically increase your risk of developing atrial fibrillation. The impact is huge. Um, it is estimated that 16 million individuals will have AFib uh, in the States as well as in Europe by 2050. And uh, currently it costs the, the US um, around $28 billion yearly for AFib and AFib related uh, disorders. This was an old Canadian um, study which looked into um, the rate of admission of three major cardiovascular uh, conditions. And you can see um, atrial fibrillation uh, depicted in blue is increasing exceptionally um, higher than the others. Uh, and I think if they continued the study, this is basically more true now than before. So as we know, AFib management has three arms. Uh, anticoagulation, which was covered extensively last time, or last session, and uh, management um, and tackling risk factors, um, and probably the cornerstone as well is better symptom control, and this basically is my talk. So there are two strategies to treat atrial fibrillation. Um, the first strategy is rate control. So the main purpose of rate control is trying to slow down atrial fibrillation. The intention is not to revert or restore sinus rhythm. <clears throat> and this can be achieved by AV blocking agent or ablating the AV node and uh, biventricular pacing. On the other hand, um, there is a rhythm strategy uh, arm where the main intention is basically to restore sinus rhythm. Okay, and this can be done by antiarrhythmic drugs and uh, AFib ablation. Okay. <clears throat> Regardless of the strategy you embark on, you really need to anticoagulate based on CHAS 65 or CHAS VAS score. And this is very important to stress. So my bulk of the talk will be cases and hopefully by the end I'll convince you that uh, there's a paradigm shift. So the first case of a um, 61 year old male with hypertension he was diagnosed to have symptomatic atrial fibrillation uh, a few years ago. He had a stress echo which showed no ischemia. His uh, left ventricular ejection fraction was normal. And, uh, LA size around 4.3 centimeters. Uh, he is, oh, he was on reverexibal and bisoprolol. And this is his ECG, ECG on presentation to the emergency room, clearly uh, demonstrating atrial fibrillation with rapid medical response. Okay, so what are, the manage what are the options in treating this patient? <clears throat> uh, straight from uh, the European guidelines, this patient has symptoms. He has a structural normal heart, so, uh, and he's symptomatic, so uh, despite being uh, on AV nodal uh, blocking agent. So you can either start antiarrhythmic drugs or catheter ablation, and we'll go into this uh, more extensively in the coming slides. So after discussion uh, with the patient, we decided to start uh, antiarrhythmic drugs. We started flaconide, uh, obviously along with bisoprolol and rivaroxaban. Uh, but during the following year, he was admitted to the emergency room three times with AFib, uh, with, uh, with fast ventricular response requiring cardioversion in two occasions. We know this, the efficacy of antiarrhythmic drugs in treatment of atrial fibrillation is very low. 
So at best, it's anywhere between 30, 40, if you want to stretch it, maybe 50% with amiodarone. And many of the amiodarone studies in trying to control atrial fibrillation reported um, uh, free um, of atrial fibrillation uh, percentage anywhere between 30 to 40%. So these drugs, they don't work very well. <clears throat> So uh, we discussed with the patient, he agreed for uh, afibrillation, uh, and uh, afibrillation was done. Uh, we've been following him, and no afib recurrence in the last year. Okay. We usually continue an uh, antiarrhythmic drugs for three months, and then we discontinue it. And uh, anticoagulation is basically based on CHAT-65. He's hypertensive, so he requires lifelong anticoagulation. The second case, this is a 32-year-old male with no medical problems. Uh, he presented uh, to our hospital with palpitation and shortness of breath in the uh, beginning of this year. And ECG shows a fib with rapid ventricular response, oh, with controlled ventricular response, sorry. Uh, no structural uh, abnormality on echo, and his thyroid function test was normal. So what are the treatment options for this patient? First presentation with atrial fibrillation, uh, no clear uh, trigger for this uh, AFib. This is from the ESC guidelines. So AFib ablation can be um, first-line therapy in some patients if they choose so. Uh, for patients with paroxysmal AFib or patients with uh, persistent AFib with no major risk factors for AFib recurrence, i.e. the typical risk factors that we discussed. Anyway. So we discussed with the patient, he didn't really want to be on any medical therapy, so we, uh, he underwent AFib ablation, um, I think in February, and he's been fine uh, ever since. I don't want to portray that all our cases of AFib ablation are successful. The recurrence rate is around 70 to 80 <coughs> percent. Sorry, the uh, AFib free survival is 7 to 80 percent, so we have 20 to 30 percent uh, recurrence rate. Okay, the third case, a 53-year-old male with diabetes and hypertension he was diagnosed to have AFib and atrial flutter in 2021. His echo showed an EF of 25% uh, with enlarged left atrium. Coronary angiogram was normal. He was on optimal heart failure, or we started him on optimal heart failure medication to maximum tolerated doses, and obviously he was on uh, NOAC for uh, his AFib. So what are the treatment options for this patient? Okay, so this patient has heart failure with a reduced ejection fraction. Uh, so the options are either amiodarone, if you opt to start an antiarrhythmic drug, or um, catheter ablation. Okay. So there's an entity called tachycardia-induced cardiomyopathy, but later they discovered that it's not the tachycardia that is causing uh, cardiomyopathy in atrial fibrillation, but instead, it's atrial fibrillation itself, even with controlled ventricular response, can cause uh, cardiomyopathy. So the proper terminology is probably arrhythmia-induced cardiomyopathy or AFib-induced cardiomyopathy. And it's LV systolic dysfunction uh, because of AFib, whether it's proximal or persistent, despite um, rate control. Um, ventricular rate during AFib does not predict, uh, predict reversibility of cardiomyopathy, but uh, LG SCAR does. Uh, and is the AFib causing cardiomyopathy or the cardiomyopathy um, is causing AFib? Uh, we know that uh, the higher the NYHA class, the more prevalent AFib. Uh, patients with NYHA, NYHA, NYHA class four, the prevalence of AFib is around 50%, whereas patients with NHA class one, it's around 10 to 15%. So we know um, it's very prevalent in this uh, cohort. Uh, one of the first studies uh, studying uh, patients with um, atrial fibrillation and uh, heart failure is the Chimera MRI study. They randomized patients um, to either of one arm, catheter ablation or medical rate control. And they were able to achieve good rate control. And what they found that in patients who underwent catheter ablation, the rejection fraction improved to like 
by 18 percent versus those who underwent medical uh, rate control it only improved by 4.4 percent and uh, ablation was done the conventional way um, if you have no scar the improvement is greater than if you had scar 22 percent versus 11 percent and more than 75% of patients with no LGE, no, no fibrosis, uh, normalize the rejection fraction. It would be unfair to discuss about AFib and cardiomyopathy without talking or mentioning this uh, study by uh, Nasser Marouche, um, Castle um, AFib, where he demonstrated that AFib ablation compared to medical therapy, whether it's rate control or antiarrhythmic, is superior in terms of primary endpoint. The endpoint was hospitalization and death, and this was significant, uh, as shown here in Kaplan-Meier curve. So this patient underwent uh, PBI as well as CTI for his flutter, and his ejection fraction improved from 25% to 55% uh, with corresponding improvement of his NYHA class. This is straight from the guidelines. Uh, patients with suspected tachycardia-induced cardiomyopathy, it's class one indication to restore sinus rhythm by catheter ablation. Even if the cardiomyopathy was not suspected to be related to AFib, uh, this can be attempted. Uh, the last case, 76-year-old uh, male with diabetes and hypertension, rheumatic heart disease. He had mechanical MVR twice. Uh, coronary angiogram um, was normal, his ejection fraction was 25%, massive LA dilatation, and he was in permanent AFib. This is his ACG, clearly demonstrating atrial fibrillation with rapid ventricular response. Of note, it is narrow. Okay. So what are the treatment options for, these, for this patient? Massively dilated left atrium, permanent AFib for many years, uh, LVF of 25%, whether it's related to the AFib or his uh, rheumatic heart disease, but his valve was fine on, on, on echo. Anyway, probably this is the first study demonstrating that AV nodal ablation with biventricular pacing is superior to medical rate control uh, with uh, improvement in not just heart failure admission, with mortality as well. Though it's a small study, around 60 to 70 patients in an arm, but it showed significant improvement in terms of um, hospital readmission and um, uh, mortality. It was basically stopped prematurely uh, due to uh, efficacy. So this patient underwent CRTP and AV node ablation in February of this year. Uh, he was seen last month. His repeat echo was 45%. He improved significantly from NOHA class 3 to NOHA class 1. So what does the international guidelines say? I kind of uh, touched upon that. So rhythm control strategy is preferred in patients with evidence of uh, tachycardia-induced cardiomyopathy, patients who are symptomatic, whether on th those who failed medication or it can be as like, first-line uh, therapy if um, deemed suitable, uh, and patients who you don't achieve rate control. If you <clears throat> plan to um, rate control, so patients with low ejection fraction, obviously you cannot use except beta blocker. Those with no F, you can use beta blocker, calcium channel blocker. Um, if you want to use uh, antiarrhythmic drugs, patients with heart failure, you kind of have no options. If the ejection fraction is low, you only have a meodarone. Um, if the ejection fraction is normal, you can use you, you, you can basically um, use a meodarone or class one C medication like flaconide and propafenone or sotalol. We don't have sotalol. We don't use it that frequently uh, in our man. Uh, if you have coronary artery disease or the patient has coronary artery disease, you're kind of basically stuck between uh, a meodarone and sotalol. Uh, class one C medication are contraindicated. Data from CAS study. So the ESC. Uh, First-line therapy uh, for symptomatic AFib, class 2A. Uh, class 1 for patients who are symptomatic who failed antiarrhythmic medications. And it's class 1 for patients with LV dysfunction, secondary to atrial fibrillation. Um, patients who require rhythm control, 
are basically more or less the same as the Canadian. Young patients, uh, recurrent uh, symptomatic AFib, evidence of LV dysfunction, and so forth. Um, this is probably data from a firm. Um, so lenient trait control around um, 110 or less than 110 uh, with six minutes walk is kind of acceptable if the patient has no symptoms with normally F. Uh, if the patient has symptoms, maybe you need to be more strict with a heart rate of 80 and if no improvement, whether you either go for ablation or antiarrhythmic drugs uh, or AV node ablation and pacing. So it's class 2A uh, for AV node ablation and uh, CRT. So to conclude, we use rate control strategy for patients who are asymptomatic, older patient, uh, patients who have normal ejection fraction, and you can achieve rate control. And obviously with no evidence of tachycardia-induced cardiomyopathy. We use rhythm control strategy for patients who are symptomatic, whether they are on antiarrhythmic drugs or uh, they were not on it, patients with uh, tachycardia-induced cardiomyopathy or any cardiomyopathy uh, for that sake, or patients you cannot achieve adequate rate control, whether because of medication side effect, tachycardia syndrome, and so forth. So this basically concludes my first talk. Uh, I'll move to the second talk, if you allow me. Okay, so uh, my second task was to talk about AFib ablation local experience. So um, I tried to change the topic, but Samah was very persistent. She wanted me to talk about this, so I said, okay, sure. <clears throat> so this is my personal experience. Uh, I don't do cryo. Uh, all my AFib ablations are radio frequency, uh, since I'm biased. So this is the outline of the talk. So Oman is relatively a small country. The population of Oman is around uh, 4.6 million. Um, we have around 9,000 doctors in Oman. Um, we are four adult cardiac electrophysiologists and one pediatric elect uh, cardiac electrophysiologist who does uh, adult as well. So we have a lot of business. This was uh, shown uh, by Samah, just basically showing that AFib is in the rice whether it's in the world or in the region. Uh, this was uh, touched upon as well, Gulf, Gulf Safe uh, Registry, and you can see, I'm pretty sure if we repeat this uh, registry, uh, the numbers will be at least double. Um, okay, so how do we select our patients, or patients, how we select them for AFib ablation? This is at least how um, I work. So the first thing before booking any patients for AFib ablation, we would try to modify um, AFib risk factors. I know some centers in the state will not offer AFib ablation if they are you know, obese and they continue smoking and drink alcohol. Um, unfortunately, we don't have dedicated uh, AFib clinics. This is in the work. Probably it will uh, come to light sometime this year, um, which is basically nurse-led clinic. Uh, but we, we kind of, we, we do it ourselves. So um, invariably, patients with atrial fibrillation, we refer them for, uh, for sleep uh, study. Uh, the good thing, my clinic is opposite to, to the sleep uh, medicine physician, so basically he has a lot of customers from me. Uh, we encourage weight loss, uh, and we do send them to the dietitian, and we refer them back to the family physician to control their diabetes and hypertension. We do have a smoking uh, cessation clinic that we refer uh, if the patient is smoker. So we try to maximize um, control of AFib risk factors as much as we can uh, before attempting AFib ablation. Who are the patients that we um, uh, take to the lab? So straight from the guidelines. Patients who, ha who are symptomatic, whether they are on antiarrhythmic or not, whether they failed antiarrhythmic or not, uh, definitely patients who have tachycardia-induced cardiomyopathy. Sometimes if these patients are very sick, we cardivert them uh, and start a amiodarone for two months and see if the rejection fraction improved. Uh, many of our patients, they don't uh, convert, and in, in that case, we just take them to the lab if they agreed. 
a new onset AFib if it's less than one year, um, young patients, uh, and inadequate trait control by AB blocking agent. This is probably more towards the AP um, area, uh, pre-procedural TEE. Uh, this is basically my practice. It's not necessarily the practice of my colleagues, but every patient who undergoes uh, afibrillation has a TE done before. Usually done in the lab. I do all my cases under GA, uh, and we do the TE before. I know there are many downside to it. If, if you have a clot, you cancel, but usually most of our patients are anticoagulated at least two months before the, the procedure. Um, having said that, we have occasionally uh, clot and we, we basically um, terminate the, uh, the, the procedure. So it's regardless of their anticoagulation status and if they presented an AFib or sinus. Everybody gets a TE. Um, this was not the case uh, where I practice. I practice in Canada and the States. Um, in Canada, everybody gets a TE, and this was basically a study that I did. Probably Samah knows this. And the incidence of patients who underwent TE before AFib ablation in the center was around 11%. It's more than what is reported in the literature. The literature reports anywhere between one to 7%, um, and we discussed the reasons why. Maybe the, the patients were sicker, and a big percentage of patients had, uh, they, they were on warfarin for one reason or the other, and the TTR was less than what you'd expect. Surprisingly, even Chad's VASC zero had, uh, patients, some patients had clots. So everybody who comes to the lab gets a TE. Uh, in the States, Patients who are anticoagulated and they present in sinus rhythm, they, we don't do a TE. Having said that, uh, it was a heavily, it's center which uses ice. So basically we'll take the ice all the way to the pulmonary artery and look into the appendage if there are any clots. Uh, so we kind of did uh, LA screening, uh, but with another method. Um, AFib ablation procedure, this is technical, so sorry for those who are uh, not electrophysiologists, I will be very quick here. We know that the triggers are from the pulmonary veins, and this was basically demonstrated by Hessiger uh, from 45 patients. We basically um, demonstrated that these foci, around 70 foci in these patients of AFib were triggered from these veins. So the standard procedure now is basically to isolate the veins. There are many ways of doing it. The way we kind of do is basically wide antral excision uh, or ablation of the veins. This is uh, how I do it, or this is how I was trained. We do it under GA, jet ventilation if it's available. We always use a flexible sheet. We, if the patient is an AFib, we usually cardivert. If the patient is, we cannot cardivert for one reason or the other. Um, we, uh, we ventricular pace. Um, we always use ice. It helps us in transeptal as well as uh, establishing, you know, contact. Um, and basically, I'll show you a case at the end. Um, and yeah, that's basically it. One word about uh, jet ventilation. It's basically high frequency, low, ti uh, low tidal volume. And from Penn uh, study, which I'll show you, there's 25% reduction of recurrence of AFib in one year. So this was the study uh, from, from, from Penn. Uh, 300 patients who underwent AFib ablation uh, were assessed for outcome, basically recurrence. Group one had CT and 3D mapping. Group two had um, 3D mapping uh, and steerable sheet, and group three had um, um, basically 3D mapping, steerable sheet, and jet ventilation. And you can see the success rate in one year, or the you know, AFib-free survival in one year was uh, 52%, 66%, and 74% for those who um, used uh, 3D mapping, obviously, steerable sheet, and jet ventilation. Okay, so this is basically a quick, uh, you can clearly see, the catheter doesn't move. Uh, on, you can see the diaphragm moves very quickly. The catheter does, obviously doesn't move with jet ventilation. You can clearly see uh, diaphragm moves, but the catheter is very stable. Uh, and you hardly see, and it, it makes a huge difference. Um, in a second, you will see conventional uh, ventilation. You can clearly see the catheter is 
moving on fluoro. Okay, it moves in 3D mapping um, and basically moves as well on ice. So it, it makes a huge difference. Okay, so local experience. Um, I perform all my ablation at the National Heart Center. Um, this was a small retrospective study. We are basically continuing it uh, from 2016 to 2019. Um, for all the AFib cases that were done in the center, 60% um, or 70% were men, and the mean age was around 40. Uh, mean age for female, around 50. Uh, most of them had, for example, AFib, around 60%, and most of them, around 50%, had AFib for one to five years. So uh, I guess once we, we, we redo this, uh, I think it, we are more aggressive now in taking these patients to the lab. Um, they had risk factors, uh, hypertension in 30 patients, and you know, diabetes, heart failure, and so forth, but they had low CHAD score. Uh, cryoablation in almost 60% of patients, radiofrequency ablation in uh, 40, this has definitely changed. Um, um, most patients underwent their first procedure, but you know, around 13 patients had redo. I think the most important uh, uh, piece of information is the rejection fraction. Those who had low ejection fraction, uh, the pre-ablation uh, uh, EF was 32% and post-ablation was around 43%. So ablation works. Um, uh, just not to waste your time, this is a quick video of the, you know, how, how we do this uh, ablation. It was done by uh, my technologists, so maybe there are a few uh, glitches or mistakes. So this is a patient I did last month. Um, a young lady with uh, presumed tachycardia induced cardiomyopathy. We failed, we cardioverted her, but she didn't uh, convert. Um, anyway, so we took her to the lab. Uh, I always use ice, uh, which is very useful in these procedures. I always check uh, pulmonary uh, velocity as well as diameter uh, uh, before the procedure and after. Okay, I use Pentary or HD grid. This is the map. We do the standard procedure, circum circumferential ablation of both veins. Um, and if the patient has flutter, we do CTI line or we try to induce the flutter. Um, invariably, uh, more than 95% of the cases with this flow, uh, we, we, we achieve uh, fast, uh, any first uh, bypass isolation with just one ablation. And we check the velocity after, just to make sure we didn't cause any pulmonary vein stenosis. Thank you.